For our speaker today, I am pleased to introduce Tiffany Dallen of Associate, uh, the Associate Partner at MAD Architects. Tiffany Dallen joined MAD in 2010. She leads the development of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art in LA and has worked on a number of MAD's iconic projects, like the Nanjing Zendai Himalaya Center in Nanjing, Ch Chaoyang Park Plaza in Beijing, Huangshan Mountain Village in Huangshan, and Sinhe Design Center in Xiamen. She has also been involved in the realization of several MAD art projects, including Moon Landscape for Swarovski and Virtu Mobile Pavilion. Welcome to Anthology, Tiffany. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Hi Tiffany. Hello. Hi. 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 I'm Alexa. I'm Burley. And I'm Arvin. And, and we're excited for your talk today. Yeah. yeah. And it's a great pleasure to have you on board uh, at Anthology Festival 2020. Wow. Well, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to keep you going. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so should I share my screen now? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. There we go. There you go. Uh, go okay, ahead, whenever you're ready. Right. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, well, thank you again for inviting me. Um, like they said, my name's Tiffany Dolan, and I'm an associate partner at MAD Architects. Um, right now, I'm actually sitting in a hotel room in Shenzhen, um, not in my usual office in the Beijing uh, MAD headquarters, um, because we're doing a project workshop here, and it was sort of a, a last-minute trip, so I'm glad all of the technical things sort of worked out um, now. Okay. So uh, today in this anthology talks, I would like to first share with you a quick introduction about MAD Architects, who we are, what we've done, and our design philosophies. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about a few of MAD's recent works in more detail, um, sort of share the project's concepts, their backgrounds, and focusing in on the relationship to the city and the urban context. There we go. Okay. Um, so, Mad Architects was founded in 2004 by Ma Yan Sung, Chun Dang, and Yosuke Hiano. Um, I joined Mad in 2010, and I've worked on many of the projects you'll see today. Uh, currently, our office has grown to about 150 architects worldwide. Um, this office was uh, this photo was taken a couple years ago at our Beijing office uh, rooftop. Um, so, our Beijing is our design headquarters, but we also have satellite offices in Los Angeles, California. Uh, Rome, Italy, and Jiaxing, China. Um, we are a Chinese-based practice with an international presence. Uh, in 2006, we won the competition for the Absolute Towers, a pair of residential buildings just outside of Toronto, Canada. And this project really propelled MAD onto the international design scene. Um, after that, we began to receive more uh, project commissions within China. Uh, we won the competition for the Harbin uh, Opera House, which is located in the northern part of China. Um, and when this project was completed and, and you know, these photos published, uh, our design really captured the world's attention and we became known for our avant-garde design. Um, this use of these free-form, organic design language, uh, this futuristic feeling, um, and the architecture's relationship to nature. Uh, we also started to gain a reputation for designing cultural buildings. Uh, this is our design for the China Philharmonic Concert Hall, uh, located in Beijing, uh, next to Workers' Stadium. This project is uh, currently under construction. Um, and this, this view shows an interior rendering uh, showing the main concert hall space. Um, this is our design for the Yiwu Grand Theater, uh, also in China. Um, and this project, I feel like, shows our development as a practice, um, working with cultural buildings. Um, and this, this design contains a 1600-seat a theater, 1200-seat concert hall, and a 2,000-person conference center. Uh, we don't only do cultural buildings, we do a lot of other types as well. Um, this is our design for the Chaoyang Park Plaza, uh, which is a mixed-use development with office and residential towers. Um, and the, the shape of the towers were inspired by nature, 
um, sort of as if they were slowly eroded over time by water. Uh, this is a view of our uh, lobby space between the two uh, office towers. Um, and in a similar mountain typology, uh, the Nanj Nanjing, Nanjing Zendai Himalaya Centers uh, contain six city blocks of mixed-use development as part of this transit-oriented development next to the Nanjing High-Speed Rail Station. Um, for this design, our urban strategy was to push the towers to the perimeter of the site and to create this green-filled, pedestrian-friendly valley space um, in between the towers with this commercial function um, in the middle of the site. This is our design for the Yabuli Entrepreneurs Congress Center. Uh, it was completed earlier this year. Um, and from the outside, uh, the building merges into the, the snowy landscape. It's located in the ski resort town of Yabuli, uh, which is even further north than Harbin. Um, and then, but then from the inside, uh, our concept was to create this warm feeling like being inside a tent. Um, so we wanted to fill the, fill the atrium space with uh, natural light in this ETFE skylight, uh, but also have this sort of warm sculpted wood panel wall uh, around you. So moving from the snow to the sand, our, our design for the wormhole library uh, is located in the far south of China um, in the city of Haikou. Uh, the library sits along the waterfront of the bay. Uh, it's constructed out of cast in place concrete um, and the interiors feature this uh, sculpted organic design language. Um, where we, uh, where we carve out these spaces for the, the library shelves and the seating and the skylights. Um, and this one is a recent uh, construction photo. And so you can see the library's concrete uh, structure was completed uh, just a few months ago. Uh, we also like to juxtapose our organic geometry um, and organic design language with uh, historical architecture. Um, as you can see here for our design for the Yucheng Courtyard Kindergarten in Beijing. Um, this was organized around a 400-year-old uh, Chinese courtyard house, um, and we designed the new building to have this rooftop playground uh, that creates this sort of surreal landscape of undulating co colorful forms. Um, and this dialogue between the, the old and the new um, shows how our design sort of respects the past while still looking towards the future. Um, Mad's recent work, uh, built work, uh, extends beyond China. Uh, a few years ago, we completed a small yet playful kindergarten called Clover House in Okazaki, Japan. Um, in 2018, we built the Tunnel of Light installation for the Ichigo Tsumari Trinale in Japan. Uh, and recently, our UNIC residential project was completed in Paris, France. Um, through our office in Rome, we have uh, several other ongoing projects uh, within, uh, within Europe. Uh, we have also been expanding into North America, uh, most notably including the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art in Los Angeles. Um, this project is for the legendary filmmaker George Lucas, um, the creator of Star Wars, uh, and, th and this project um, actually is very close to me uh, because I've been working on this project since 2014 uh, when we won the competition for it to design the museum in Chicago. Um, it's since then moved to the final site in Los Angeles. Uh, and currently, the structure topped out actually earlier this month. Um, so it'll be very excited, uh, exciting to see this one completed. Okay, so the first project that I'll talk in more depth about today is the Shenzhen Bay Culture Park. Um, so actually, this project is the one that um, is the reason why I'm speaking to you from a sort of dark uh, hotel room in Shenzhen and not in Mad's uh, design office, uh, because we have, uh, it's a very ambitious project. Um, and we've been working on this project for about two years now. Uh, it faces many challenges. Um, and so we were having some client workshops uh, this week. And so I'm very excited to share this project with you today. Uh, a little bit of background about the, the project. Um, the city of Shenzhen is located on the border of China next to Hong Kong. Uh, its development and urbanization began only about 40 years ago, um, and it really started to boom as a technology hub. 
uh, Shenzhen's nickname is actually China's Silicon Valley. Um, so the city is very, is very vibrant, uh, full of energy and, and young people. And, and while the city of Shenzhen is, is quite dense, um, it's also surrounded by nature. Uh, the mountains form this background to the towers, um, and then you have the bay, the waterfront, um, in the front of the in the front of the city. And so, and so throughout all of this urban development, you know, the waterfront edge of Shenzhen Bay has remained uh, an important public space uh, as a park space for the people of Shenzhen. So, for the Shenzhen Bay Culture Park, we wanted to create. Uh, a poetic landscape with a dynamic urban area at the back of the site and this quiet timelessness of nature at the front. Our concept for Shenzhen Bay Culture Park is to create a grand civic gesture of a park for the people of Shenzhen, um, extending the nature of the bay into the city. Um, in this poetic landscape, we treated the buildings like stones in the landscape. So that way you discover them and you view, see them in different ways as you walk through the park. We also wanted to bring people from the city into the, into the nature along the center access line. Uh, we designed this bridge that connects from the city to the nature beyond. Um, and the massing of the buildings to the north and to the south open up the center part to be a public park space and, and has this great views to the bay. And our architectural intent uh, for, the, for the building shapes is, is, is the stone, stone geometry. And, and the idea for that is to create this sense of ancient future, uh, like the shape of the stones that are smooth and rounded, like a stone that you would find on the beach or on the river that's been shaped by the forces of nature, slowly eroding over thousands of years. Um, but when we scale up the stones to, from something you can hold in your hand to something 20 or 50 meters tall um, and juxtapose them with this fluid des design language, this organic curvature, it starts to create this really futuristic feeling. Um, and I really like this rendering in particular because I think it conveys this, this spirit and feeling of this uh, idea of ancient future that we're trying to achieve with this project. Uh, walking around and between the stones, we've created this, these interesting spatial experiences where the architecture and landscape uh, form one composition together. Um, in describing this project, Ma Yun Song said, Architecture should be integrated into nature, shaping a landscape where one can find spiritual belonging in the city. Uh, I think that really resonates well with this, with this project. Uh, so this project area is actually quite large. Um, it's about 150,000 square meters, 100, sorry, 180,000 square meters, um, including three levels of basement and four levels above ground. Um, and about 50,000 of that is, um, is exhibition program uh, relating to the, to the museum and the exhibition galleries. Um, so we just divided the, the site into the sort of south and north side uh, with this shared education component in the middle. Um, so each side of it has sort of one large stone uh, with one large feature gallery inside of it along with this cluster of smaller stones that are, are oriented around a courtyard. Um, and then this, the center axis at the middle of the site um, is the space, is the, is the great civic gesture of this, of this project, um, where we have this great lawn and this water feature, uh, where, which, which uh, we can host uh, large cultural events uh, for up to 10,000 people. Um, so this is a section through the south South large stone um, that I mentioned before, um, and, and it shows the, the large gallery space within the stone um, and then the relationship of the stone to the lobby below. Um, and underneath the green roof landscape, we have exhibition spaces and public spaces for the museum. And this, this is a view of the south courtyard space, which is filled with water uh, to create this more sort of quiet and contemplative environment. Um, but you can sort of still see the stones peeking out um, around you. So it has this very interesting uh, dynamic feeling at the same time. 
Um, and at the top of the, of the big south stone, there's actually a pathway that winds up the, the, to the very, from the green roof to the very top, which allows visitors to walk up there um, and to go to this outdoor amphitheater space where you can get this views to the park and to the, to the bay beyond. And then on the north side of the site, we have this one tall stone which contains several floors of galleries. And at the very top, there is a 25 meter uh, gallery space. So this is that one grand uh, gallery space within the North Stone. Um, and we have a skylight at the very top of it, which brings in this diffuse natural light into this tall gallery space. And in the lobby space, we create these interesting moments where you can see the relationship between the interior and the exterior. And you can see the stones sort of continuing um, into the building. Um, so I think this view is quite interesting because, because it has that uh, indoor-outdoor relationship. And then on the ground floor at the center of the site, there is a shared entrance plaza between the north, south, and education lobbies. Um, Shenzhen is a very hot and rainy climate, uh, so we wanted to create this large canopy space over the entrances to shield the visitors from the sun and the rain. Um, the shaded outdoor space under the roof uh, provides a comfortable space for people as they, as they enter the building. Um, education plays an important role in the cultural exchange uh, of the museum. So we've designed an education center that connects the North and South museums. Um, on the left side is the, is the lobby space, this double height lobby space. Uh, the right side are these two images. The lower one is a 800-seat multifunction hall, and the upper one is a 300-seat lecture hall. In addition to this, we also have uh, classrooms and studios um, for smaller scale learning events. And this rendering shows uh, the interior space of one of the smaller stones on the north courtyard, where we've designed a sculptural library, um, sort of encased by wood, uh, approach with surrounded by these bookshop uh, bookshelves to encourage uh, learning and create a stronger sense of community. So one of the important aspects of the project is the facade design of the of the stones themselves. Um, so Ma's concept for the facade is to feel really monumental and timeless, um, sort of like a monolith um, from from far away. Um, but when you get up close, you start to see a finer level of detail um, in the stones. And in, in order to achieve this effect, um, we're designing a facade system using natural stone um, that, wraps, that wraps the stone geometries with this linear pattern um, and follows the curvature of the geometry. So we're working with RFR engineers. Um, we've collaborated with them before on several other projects um, to work through the technical aspects of the facade. Uh, the images on the left are sort of design process ones um, where you can see we're using Grasshopper uh, to analyze the surface curvature and determine the areas of tightest curvature um, in order to optimize the facade pattern in those problematic areas. Um, we've also developed some scripts to generate the, the modular stone pattern while still creating this randomized appearance. Um, and we're also studying the physical appearance of the stone by building these mock-ups with different types of stone textures, panel sizes, and joint dimensions. Um, so by both the, the sort of digital, digital and the analog, uh, we're building, building the mock-ups. We're able to see in real life sort of the effects that we're um, designing on the computer. And for several other conditions along the facade, we've also studied how the details come together by modeling these sort of what we call chunk models, um, where there are small chunks of the building and we visualize the details um, of these chunks. And that really plays an important role in this design process because it helps to both communicate our ideas to the clients and to the consultants. And then at a later stage, we'll also build some of these conditions at a one-to-one -one scale um, on the site as sort of a visual or a technical mock-up. Um, so this is a photo of the site that I took today. Um, 
we had a coordination meeting on the site. Um, so this is currently what, what the site looks like. Um, we still have a very long way to go. Um, they're just starting on the, on the foundation work, um, but it's, uh, I think it's this project I'm especially excited uh, to see completed. Okay, so the next project that I'll share with you is for the Chujo Sports Park. Um, and this is one of our largest projects to date. Um, the design of it includes a 30,000 seat stadium, a gymnasium, an auditorium, national sports complex, outdoor training fields, museum, hotel, and retail programs. Um, so the overall master plan is, is quite large, um, but right now they're focusing on the, the 30,000 seat stadium for the construction. Um, so for this project, uh, our concept for it was to embed all of these sports programs into the earth to create this large scale land art landscape in the center of the city um, with the hope that it becomes a place of spiritual belonging for the future of the city. Um, this project abandons all of the traditional urban strategies of large independent landmarks um, with sort of small pockets of landscape in between them. Um, so instead, we blur the boundary of what is natural landscape and what is urban space. Um, in creating this poetic landscape, uh, Ma Yansang said, we dream not only of creating an urban space about sports and ecology, but also turning it into a unique land art park for the world, establishing a relationship between the city's heritage and the history of Shan Shui culture. Uh, so I think, I feel like in a traditional stadium design, um, the exterior sort of highlights the structure, the structure of the, the stadium or creates a sort of flashy facades or strange geometries. Um, but here we've created this more mysterious form uh, with these undulating hills and these mountains um, that actually allow people to climb up and traverse over the stadiums and through the landscape. Um, for the 30,000 seat stadium, it's sort of the only indicator of, of where it is, is this floating canopy, um, this steel structure uh, with a membrane roof um, that is used to, to shade the, the seating areas of the, of the stadium. So the interior of the stadiums, um, all, each of them all have different atmospheres, um, we tried to create uh, to keep this connection between the interior and exterior shapes. Um, so the main stadium, this is a view of the main stadium uh, where we have this exposed concrete shell underneath the green roof. Um, and you can sort of see in the background these large concrete piers that support the, the stadium seating. Um, so for this project, actually, the on-site concrete was one of the most technically difficult um, things for us to design and build um, for this project. And I think, and here we also worked with uh, some really great landscape designers. Uh, we worked with Peter Walker on the concept of this, of this park, where, uh, who created this, this rendering, this interesting rendering where the trees are painted white to, to follow the shape of the, of the canopy design. Um, and another, another Ma quote about this project um, describes his desire to connect with nature, saying that the, the relationship between man and nature it's not only about ecology and sustainability, uh, but it's also about spirit and mood. Um, the feelings that you have when you walk through a forest, the solitary and contemplative spaces of this surreal landscape. So in our designs, MAD reshapes the consumption of the city over nature, pushing back on this rapid urban development of our modern cities and reevaluating and sort of challenging preconceptions of building typologies and pushing towards a future where we pursue a harmonious relationship between man and nature. I think uh, we've seen that with the Shenzhen Bay Culture Park, also with the Chuzhou Sports Campus. Um, and I think that's a, a very strong theme that we have in a lot of our projects, um, this idea of the Shan Shui City and the, the, the des design philosophies behind that. 
Um, so this is a, a drone photo recently taken last year um, of the construction site. Uh, so you can see that the site work is being done for the entire master plan, um, but only the architecture building of the 30,000 seat stadium um, is currently being constructed. So that will be the first one that opens. Um, and then there'll be sort of, that one's phase 1A and then there's 1B is the other stadiums and phase two is the, sort of the rest of the master plan. Um, so here is a more recent picture of the stadium uh, under construction. Uh, you can see that the, the concrete work has been mostly completed um, and then the steel structure of the canopy is also almost done. Um, as I said before, the, this project uh, is really defined by the cast in place concrete. And this was the, one of the biggest technical challenges of this. Um, this is a photo of the construction site showing the outdoor concourses of the stadium, uh, where we have these exposed concrete piers uh, using this uh, sort of curved profile, um, and then also seeing the, the stepping of the seating above. Um, and so I, I really like these photos, um, especially in the black and white. Um, I feel like even though, you know, the, the, the project isn't completed yet, I think there's the poetic language of the organic curved ribs and the board formed concrete texture um, already creates a very powerful and, and compelling space and, and spatial experience. So um, yeah, I, I think this project also has a lot of, a lot of potential when it's completed. This next project is for the Jashing train station um, and the surrounding master plan design. Um, so Jashing is an important city to Chinese history in particular because it is where the Communist Party was founded um, in 1921. Um, they actually, uh, the first the first Congress of the, of the Communist Party happened in Jiaxing on a boat. Um, and actually those party members arrived to the city on in the train station, via the train station. So that's sort of why this is an important uh, project to the city of Jiaxing, um, because not only was it is, is a historic train station location, but also um, Jiaxing is an important regional link between Shanghai and Hangzhou along the high-speed rail line. Um, so people coming from the high-speed rail um, will enter the city through this train station. Uh, so Ma's idea for the train station design was to draw from history while looking towards the future. Um, so we decided to honor the, the, the historic train station um, I believe it was built in 1907 and then was destroyed um, in the 30s, I think. I can't remember the dates exactly. Um, but, but in our design, we decided to rebuild at a one-to-one -one scale the historic train station that the Communist Party founders entered the city from. Um, and so by keeping the historic train station, we actually built the new station underground around it. Um, and so you can see here the sort of center part is the skylight looking down into the train station below and sort of the roof, the roof of the main wait, waiting hall um, to either side of the historic train station. Um, so it was important for us that the, that the new train station be, still be filled with natural light, even though it's underground, um, and that the scale of the space, the interior spaces related to uh, related to the human scale and felt very comfortable to be in. Um, because I think one of, one of the things you notice, uh, especially when you travel around China um, and travel to these different train stations, is that each city you go to, each new train station seems to be bigger and taller or more complex roof shapes or, or some sort of ostentatious design. Um, but for Ma, we wanted to do the opposite, actually. We didn't want to just design something big and grand just, just for the sake of being big and grand. Um, so, so we were really focusing on the human environment. 
and the human experience and how to make this waiting hall feel like a comfortable environment and atmosphere for people, um, all the while providing these sort of complex circulation routes uh, from these various forms of transportation connections. So being on one side very comfortable, but also very functional at the same time. Uh, so one of the ways we achieved the, the, the natural light in the sunken, sunken spaces was, was by creating these sunken plazas, um, opening up these holes in the, in the ground plane and then planting trees below. So that way it brings in both natural light and sort of this and nature into the underground spaces. Um, and this rendering shows actually the underground connection that connects to the train platforms. Um, so there are actually two, two links that connect north to south uh, the train station just for um, sort of urban circulation. Um, and then there are also the links to the train tracks themselves. So because the, the train station is already underground, the, the waiting hall is already underground, it's a very smooth and easy flat transition in order to get to your, um, to your future destination. Um, and in this design, we wanted to create this very uh, futuristic environment. Um, so like I said, uh, the, you know, in this rendering, you can see the, the train tracks in the center of the site with the two waiting halls to the north and the south of it. Um, on the north of it, you see the small uh, train, original train station uh, that we've rebuilt. Um, and then we also have this tree-filled plaza um, to the north of the site that then connects to this to, to the park space further north of it. Um, and then to the south side, we designed this plan for this commercial commercial development that prioritizes this public green space for the city. Um, I, I, I really like this rendering because I feel like the, the amount of greenery and trees you see around the train station um, is very different than what you would see in, in any other urban conditions around other train stations in China. Um, so I feel like this really shows our sort of shan shui design philosophies of infusing um, architecture and nature together. Um, and actually for this project, we, the, our sort of nickname for this project is the train station in the forest. Um, and this is a view from that north entrance plaza space with all of the um, trees planted within it. Um, and also very similar to sort of the design language of the Chujo Sports Park, uh, we use this extensive green roof and landscape uh, to the south of the site uh, that merges the landscape and architecture together. Um, for the commercial functions. And with these large urban design strategies, um, I think this project really exemplifies MAD's values um, and ideals that uh, well-designed civic spaces should belong to everyone. Um, this notion that architecture, landscape, urban design, um, they should all work together to create good public space uh, filled with natural light and nature. Um, so this is also a project that's under construction now. Um, this photo I think was taken last week. Um, and so here you can see the, the, the most of the basement structure has been completed um, and the waiting room um, roofs are also in progress. Uh, this is a view within the main waiting room, the rendering that I showed previously. Um, so also still in progress, um, the glass facades have been installed and I think some of the roofing has been installed, uh, but we're still very far away uh, to go with this being completed. Um, this actually is a view from the train tracks uh, where you can see the uh, this outdoor canopy structure. Um, this part has been completed and then the the building in the background is one of the commercial buildings. Um, so that one is still in progress. Okay, so this next project takes us out of China and into the Netherlands. Um, and this is our design for the Phoenix Museum of Immigrants in Rotterdam. So in the 1900s, the port of Rotterdam was a major immigration hub for people leaving Europe, uh, mostly headed towards Ellis Island in New York. Millions of Im 
of migrants left Europe from these embankments, and the Phoenix warehouse played an important role in that process. Um, the warehouse building will be transformed into a museum um, to commemorate the people who passed through the building on their journey to America. So MAD was commissioned to design the center atrium and this rooftop panorama platform for the Phoenix Museum. Um, and we designed this futuristic and dynamic spiraling stair that emerges through this glass roof with this burst of energy um, and it embodies this spirit of optimism and the idea of limitless potential. Uh, so the museum building contains two floors of galleries. Um, the architectural interventions on the warehouse is very minimal, um, except for the atrium. Um, that's sort of the only main uh, intervention into the historic building. Um, also, you can see on the left side, there's this sort of sculptural bird um, that's perched on the, the edge of the roof. Um, so the bird, the bird and the viewing platform are kind of the main markers of the museum from the, the waterfront space and the the bird sort of signifies this idea of migration in a sort of abstract way. Uh, and this is a view of the interior lobby space uh, on the ground floor lobby. Uh, so you can see here these two spiraling stairs and this glass elevator um, that leads visitors to the second floor and also to the rooftop viewing platform. Um, so this, this one was the most sort of complex geometrical uh, part of the project. Um, we've, we have these two pathways leading visitors up and down to the viewing platform at the top. Uh, there's a slow ramp that's more meandering, the blue colored one, um, with a sort of wider spiraling movement. Um, and then we have this fast ramp with this tighter curvature sort of spiraling within the, the, slow, sh the slow ramp shape. Um, to allow visitors to either go up the slow ramp or down the fast ramp or vice versa. Um, so one of the biggest challenges for this project uh, was how to figure out the slopes and the step dimensions and with this ramp curvature and the head heights um, of the sort of crossing ramp shapes. Uh, so we did many, many, many design iterations. Um, and this is sort of the final version of what we had discovered through the design process. Um, and we determined, you know, the ideal step dimension, uh, sort of a shorter, faster step or a longer elongated step, what's comfortable to take sort of two steps or three steps or one step on it. Um, and so we, we did a lot of studies to figure this out um, and also still to achieve this sort of organic spiraling uh, spiraling shape where it's not always um, the same the same slope going up or down. Um, so this is an axon view of the ground floor lobby space. Um, so the design of the lobby connects the, the city side to the waterfront side. Um, and the lobby contains a, a lot of important visitor functions like an information desk, cloakroom, shop, a cafe, uh, a lot of functional things that you need uh, for, a, for a museum. And, you know, we have this very futuristic ramp uh, design language, but for the rest of the lobby interior, uh, we designed a very minimal uh, design in, in order to allow the beauty of the original con concrete structure to be the main focus of the design. Uh, this is a photo of the existing uh, warehouse design or warehouse um, site. Uh, so, you know, in a similar way with the Joshing train station, um, we are very respectful of the architectural history of the site, and we try to enhance this uh, with our design interventions. Um, and for this project, I think uh, the museum foundation president stated the goals of the design quite poetically. Uh, he said, what we want to show is that this is a universal story. People at some point of their lives make a decision, whether it's forced by war, poverty, religious reasons, or something else. They decide to put everything they have into one or two suitcases and to make this journey to a new world and to start over again. What we want to do is to understand that emotion and to show the emotion. 
Um, so I feel like Mad's design proposal um, really emulates this feeling and this emotion that the that the museum is trying to achieve. Um, and through the design, it, it enforces the, the goals for the museum. Okay, so this is the, the final project um, that I'll share with you today. Uh, it's called Garden House. Um, so this project is MAD's first completed project in the United States. Um, we have several other ongoing projects, but this one is the first completed one. Um, and it's located in the Beverly Hills neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. So Ma's concept for Garden House was inspired by the, by the landscape design of Beverly Hills and the Hollywood Hills area. So actually, as Ma drove around the site, he noticed that many of the houses were surrounded by these very tall green hedges and that you could only sort of see the tops, the very tops of the pitched roof houses behind them. And it, it created the sense of sort of privacy and exclusivity. Um, but also then in the surrounding Hollywood Hills neighborhood, um, you know, we have these green hills and then these sort of houses clustered on top of them. Um, so these two, these two ideas and the, the relationship of the architecture to landscape um, of the local environment uh, was really the basis for our design strategy for Garden House. Uh, so, so Garden House um, is really based on Mads, sort of going back to what I've said in Zhuzhou and Shenzhen, um, this project really shows Mads' Shanshui City design philosophy. Um, our goal for this project was to bring nature um, into these dwelling units in the urban environment. Um, so we did this by creating this two-story uh, green wall on the facade, um, these rooftop gardens uh, with trees, and then um, a center courtyard garden um, inside the site. Um, so with this project, there are four levels of residential units. Um, and then on the ground floor, um, there is a retail program, um, which is not yet open, I think. Um, at least in this photo, it's not open. I'm not sure about now. Um, and, but I think they were planning to open a art gallery um, and also maybe some sort of coffee shop or sort of food retail component um, in order to sort of activate the street front um, along Wilshire Boulevard, uh, because actually Wilshire Boulevard runs from downtown all the way to the water, to Santa Monica. Um, so this project becomes sort of a gateway to the Beverly Hills neighborhood along Wilshire Boulevard. Um, so it's a quite important uh, location in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and this is a view from the top. Um, you can see uh, Wilshire is on the right hand side and then on the left hand side there's sort of smaller residential streets um, so that's sort of more of the back quieter back side of the site um, so along along the, the smaller street we um, we have three three-story townhouses um, each with their own private roof garden um, and then you can sort of see the, the, the rest of the sort of houses with their white pitched roofs uh, rotated at sort of various angles um, and then now you can see the, the courtyard at the middle of the site. So, um, so this is a, two views, one of the courtyard, one of the interior spaces um, of this project. And, and uh, the center courtyard is hidden from the street. Um, so it creates the sense of privacy, sort of like a secret treasure um, for the residents to enjoy. Um, and many of the residential units face, actually face both directions, one looking out to this, you know, within the one unit, it lo looks out to the city, but also in towards the courtyard. Um, and then some of them also have this double height living spaces underneath this pitched roof shape. And with the courtyard concept, um, Ma's idea for it, you know, in Beijing, we have a lot of courtyard houses, that's a very 
um, traditional typology for, for housing um, in the Chinese architecture, um, but not really so in America. Um, so Ma's idea for the courtyard was to create the sense of community between the residents um, and the landscape, the landscape within it. Uh, and and we, we worked with a landscape designer um, to try to create this sort of delicate balance between privacy between each of the units, but also this sort of sense of community and togetherness. Um, and the green wall facade is, uh, we also worked with a landscape uh, architect on this one um, because it's, it's quite complex. Um, and sort of the main feature, one of the main features of this project. Um, and the green wall facade features this mixture of drought resistant plants um, that create this beautiful tapestry of colors and textures. Um, and the plant types were designed to bloom and flower at different times of the year. Um, so the facade is sort of always changing uh, with each new season. Um, this is a view looking at, sort of looking up from below at the green facade, where you can see the, the windows and the balconies um, that punctuate this green wall. And, and from the interior, uh, looking out the window, your, your view to the city is sort of framed um, by the nature. Uh, so, uh, the garden house, um, it really aims to, to foster this idea, this harmony between humanity and nature in the middle of this urban context. Um, with this project, as with the previous ones that I've shared with you today, uh, it really illustrates Mad's, Mad's vision uh, for the future of cities um, by bringing nature back into the urban realm. Um, and, and the idea of this Shan Shui city design philosophy of creating this emotional um, connection to nature. Uh, I, I really like this, this aerial view um, of garden house because when you look at our project, when you see our project, it, it sort of stands out, but also at the same time sort of fits in. Um, and you know, the house shapes, the green wall um, are not really uncommon elements that you would see in the city of Los Angeles, but the sort of dichotomy of, of placing them together creates this, this interesting um, visual experience. Um, okay, so that's the, the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much for watching. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thanks, yeah. thanks, Stephanie. I love that MAD creates, combines art, nature, and architecture at the same time functionality. And it creates really an experiential space for your users. For the neighborhood. For, for the, the community. neighborhood, for the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. That I'm sure us Filipinos will be inspired to be more creative in designing our built environment compared to our like just boxes and <laughs> concrete buildings. But with that, can I ask how how do you define the curves and like oh okay, this should go here and that? Like what's your approach on creating the, the free-form sculptures that is architecture from mad architects? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a really, really good question. question. Um, so, for all of our projects, you know, even though we do a lot of projects internationally in different areas, different cities around China, uh, we also try to be very contextual, where we think about the site, think about the history of the city, and try to find meaning in that. Um, like thinking of one project in particular, I mentioned at the very beginning, the Iwu Grand Theater with these sort of swooping uh, white sails. That was inspired by the, the historic boats that used to um, trade along, that, along the river around it. So this idea of, of bringing sort of imagery of bringing back um, the history of the site and of the city in a new and futuristic way. I think that's that's sort of what we try to achieve uh, with different with all of our different projects. Okay, so we actually have a question from our viewers on Facebook. It says, 
how does the garden house how how does the garden house been accepted by the american buyers living there, living there as they are very private and non-community based society is that, are they? Uh, how is it accepted by the american culture um so for, for that project actually i'm not quite sure what they've sold or what they haven't sold yet um there there aren't that many i think there are only 18 residential units in in that project because many of them are you know three or four bedroom um apartments so there it looks like there are a lot of little ones but it's actually only a few um more expensive ones um <laughs> i think i think actually so I'm not quite sure I know the, uh, the answer to that question. Um, let me think. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to talk with the LA office and get back to you on that. I know, I know actually for a fact that the, the, the mayor of Los Angeles really let, or the mayor of Beverly Hills really likes this project um, because he thinks it sort of brings a new type of architecture to the Beverly Hills area because it's kind of a traditional, I would say, neighborhood um, where there's not a lot of new, interesting, different types of architecture. So I think in, in that way, sort of in the civic and urban realm, it creates something very new and different, um, but not so, so different. You know, like the shape of the, the pitch houses, pitch roof houses, the, the green hey, wall are all familiar, familiar aspects. aspects. Like you, know, had, like you had to create something familiar for mm -hmm. the community as well like what you said that you take you guys take into consideration the context, the context of, of the community the surrounding space yeah. yeah so we have another question by cat that long yeah. she asks are your projects pursuing lead certification um, so that really depends um, on the client, if the client wants to pursue that or not. Um, actually, so I would say in a larger sense, uh, the, the idea of about sustainability um, is a really interesting uh, conversation um, for MAD projects because, because our, so many of our projects are inspired by nature or have a lot of landscape with it. Um, we sort of view our projects as inherently sustainable. Um, you know, the green roof the, the, is as sort of a rainwater collection system, uh, mitigating, flooding, you know, all of this sort of uh, sustainable aspects that you would get sort of the checkpoints off of for, for lead um, come inherently in our design. Like we don't, we don't specifically go out and say, oh, we need to put this here or trees here because of this or that. But we, we, we believe strongly that that people want to be around nature, that people want to be within nature um, and, and to have that sort of merging of architecture and landscape design together. So, so I'd say inherently our designs are sustainable and that does help with the lead process if the client wants to pursue, pursue lead. Okay, so let's have a group photo before we wrap things up. Okay. Well, it's just a screenshot. <laughs> so, okay, okay. one, two. Uh, again, again. <laughs> one, two. Okay. All right. Thank uh, you. Hi. Uh, yeah. Tiffany, thank you for uh, participating at the Dology Festival. And regards to Ma, so... Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, wait. Before you leave, there's a last question that wants to say something from John. He asks, have you had any challenges in making the community adapt to your designs and programs, especially when introducing a new culture like community-centered garden house? Hmm. Uh, I, actually, I think our, most of our projects have been pretty well received. Um, by the community. I think um, with, our, with our projects, 
in, in China. Um, they've been well received uh, sort of by both the, the government and the, both the government and also the local level. Um, we actually uh, not, I didn't show this project, but we, we do have a project called Baizawan, which is social housing, uh, low, low income affordable housing in China. It's actually quite large um, in south west, east side of Beijing. Um, and in there, we, we tried to incorporate a lot of these community functions um, into the design. And I think that one has been well received, at least in China, it's been well received. Um, for Garden House, I'm not sure yet. Let's see how it goes. That one's still quite new. Um, so we'll see if, how that one gets received um, maybe in a few years. I think our viewers are asking a lot about how your architecture is received because the projects you shared is so out of this world in our small minds as Filipinos. And we're really, it, it was, it's such an inspiration for us to be able to see what you guys are doing in your practice and your profession. So, uh, so there's another question. Quick question. Quick question. What are your views on greenwashing? in architecture? Um, I mean, if we say greenwashing is just like fulfilling lead standards just to get the check marks in terms of greenwashing, or just like the, the towers where you see people Escape add trees. Your projects, yeah. 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 Okay, so I think that's, that's it? No, no, I mean, oh, uh, what, what she, she was asking is, uh, greenwashing by means of putting a lot of landscape in, in your mm -hmm. project. So what, do, what are your views on that? Uh, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think, I think if you look at a lot of other international architecture offices, like, uh, like the Euro European ones maybe, or American ones, I think it's becoming a larger trend to do that, um, to show these renderings with you know, greenery all in the towers and trees all at the top and whatever. Um, and so I think it's becoming more of an international trend, I would say. We, but again, going back to the idea of sustainability, that's not, we're not trying to be sustainable. We're not trying to, to just add trees because, oh, you know, it's a social value. You know, people really want this, you know, it's sort of this movement socially, blah, blah, blah. like we had this idea you know, 10 or more years ago where, where we wanted to bring nature into the city because we, we, we felt like, it, you know, the, the, the city becomes so, some of the cities in China, especially are becoming so dense um, with just all architecture and urbanism and, and you don't, and it's missing that sort of nature and the, the feeling of um, being inside nature. Um, so I think, it goes back to the sort of original original concept for each project is is based in nature, not to not put on afterwards. It's not put on after the fact. Oh, let's add some green. Let's add some trees. Let's make it lead. Okay, go go go. But it's the fact that the original concept is to bring nature into our projects. So it, it's it's not greenwashing. It's not you know biomimicry. It's not necessarily just lead. It's just how to create comfortable environments for people. How you can make your lifestyle better. Yes. yes. It's, yeah, 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 exactly. <clears throat> it's about be creating the approach and then like, it's just an added bonus if you get certified or whatever. Yeah. But yes. then the context is, the content and the context is more important. And the intention. Mm -hmm. And the intention. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany, for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Stay, Stay connected. Thank you, too. Thank you. Bye. Join us again next year as a panelist. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes.